Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Candice Howarth. I'm a senior research fellow and the knowledge integrator for CCAN, which, uh, for those of you who don't know, is the Centre for the Evaluation of Complexity Across the Nexus. Um, and as part of the, the work that we're doing, we're looking at developing and testing new me methods, essentially to improve policy making um, and evaluation. And as part of our activities, we also like to run the seminar series. Um, so we're very excited to have Professor Peter Davis from the University of Auckland, uh, who's in the UK for another week. And he's going to be talking to us today about evaluating policy scenarios with micro simulation. Um, and I know throughout the presentations, he's left space for Q&A. And if I could just ask you, because we're filming the event, not to introduce yourselves before you ask a question, that would be great. Thanks a lot, Candice, and thanks, folks, for uh, interrupting your lunch hour to come and hear this. Uh, so I put Peter Davis and colleagues because this kind of work cannot be done by any single person. You need a team. Uh, also, the funding, the Ministry of Business Innovation and Employment, sounds a bit like your biz, uh, which is a more applied research funder uh, where we interact more with policymakers, and the Health Research Council, which again is applied but is more science driven. Uh, again, where we, we interact with, uh, with um, uh, uh, policy makers. So, and that scenario is a bit of Auckland, which you come and visit us sometime. Uh, and that's a fan tower. There'll be a few birds knocking around. So, um, in the first uh, 10 minutes, I'll tell you a little bit about my career experience, because actually I've worked in the medical school for a number of years, and that forces you to be much more oriented towards uh, policy questions. And the whole issue about counterfactuals and policy is, in many ways, policy making is about considering counterfactuals in the real world. And how can you mimic that using various uh, approaches? Microsimulation, what is it? So uh, I'll go into that. I won't go into an enormous amount of detail. Uh, for a start, I rely on my team members to do a lot of this, and I can easily get tripped up. But I do know the basics. Some international examples, because there's some very well-established um, microsimulation models, which are used uh, uh, you know, de rigueur you know, as an assistance to decision-making and policy-making, along with other forms of, of advice. Um, so here, then I'll, I'll talk about the team and the portfolio. Um, this is something we've done about 10 years. Uh, we've kind of made it up to some extent as we've gone along. One thing you find about microsimulation, there's no one else, frankly. There's no cookbook. There's no uh, uh, ready um, uh, package you can use. Uh, anyway, so I'll talk about two models, a static model, which is something I, I put together for the Health Research Council looking at the uh, health impacts of an uh, aging society, what about funding requirements on, uh, in, on, on, on the health system. The second one is the, the uh, dynamic model. The, the static model is just before and after, or projection to change between parameters. And the dynamic model is one that actually moves along, where you, we use a life cycle. And I kind of like the idea of an inquiry system. It's one where we build software where you can actually ask it questions. And uh, that's the kind of idea I really like. It's actually very hard to do. Um, and uh, anyway, I'll get to that. And finally, a few conclusions and discussion. And as Candice said, along the way, uh, it is important, because this stuff can get quite technical, to ask a few questions if, uh, if things aren't coming clear, uh, or if you have some counter view uh, to put, put forward. So just something about my background. So I worked in med school for 30 years as a social scientist, and inevitably that's multidisciplinary. Um, as a social scientist, you're generally at the bottom of the pecking order. <laughs> Um, and, and people use advanced methodological approaches, so you've really got to be on your metal. And I found very quickly that even though I had a bit of a stats background, you were surrounded by people who were, who were able to argue the toss on, on various things, odds ratios, randomized control trials, etc., etc. And it was policy relevant. There was no point in doing anything unless you could, you could say this could be improving the health of the population in some way. So that was, that was great. The, the, one of the great revelations for me was there's a thing called evidence-based medicine. I thought all medicine was evidence-based, but actually I came across this thing that the truth was, for generations, people have been authoritatively declaiming about various uh, medical interventions, and they could actually be wrong. Um, and uh, so I realized that almost anything that we could take for granted in the policy arena, including something that is hard and fast as medicine, actually needed solid evidence behind it, and you needed to test it, uh, in the open and, uh, and, not, and not bow to anybody's authority unless it was evidence-based. Uh, and of course, you can make a, 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 a connection to evidence-informed policy, and I don't, I don't accept any kind of simple linear concept. I just feel, in the end, policy uh, uh, 
fiats need to have an evidence base. Could be wrong, could be right. Um, as part of it. It could be a political decision in the end, but in the end you need the evidence there. And the, the final thing that struck me, as a social scientist in a rather soft discipline, sociology, the truth is we were making knowledge claims in, in a context where they were constantly challenged, firstly by one's colleagues, the medics said, what's this sociology type thing? Uh, and, but also in the policy context where you, you were up against other people, vested interests in particular, who didn't really, really want to know, and, and similarly, I think sociology's got a bit of a problem of um, um, sometimes a bit of uh, lack of reality and engagement with the real world, because in the end, you've got to say, I'm willing to stand on this, which few of my colleagues in sociology department really have to do. I actually have to sometimes uh, tiptoe out of the university and tell somebody outside the university, here's my advice, and if you follow it, I think it'll happen. <laughs> and uh, that's the problem uh, in this area that, that my colleagues very rarely have to meet in the social sciences. That sometimes you're making knowledge claims somebody may actually follow uh, and they may uh, introduce some policy which, wow, may have an impact on the real world and it better be, be strong in place. So, that's, uh, that, so that is my background as to why I've come to this sort of uh, you know, epiphany, you might say, uh, in this room. So anyway, I put together a book called Data Inference and Observational Settings, which was an attempt because the truth was in sociology, um, it's a four volume set of readings on the whole area about how the hell we make uh, inferences from observational, by observational I mean non-experimental data. And, uh, um, it, you know, we, we very rarely in the social sciences can actually do randomized controlled trials, but we can do uh, various other things. And this is where I came across the counterfactual approach to causal claims, um, that in a way you're making a, a, a counterfactual approach about the real world, where you're saying that if this policy intervention had not been present, we would not have the observed policy outcome. So you're saying, you know, if we could modify the real world in some way and made this policy intervention, that's the counterfactual, which doesn't happen at present. If we did introduce it, then this outcome would occur. And this, for me, is quite a, 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 rev, a rev, revelation about how to think about causal claims, that in, ma in many ways <coughs> you're making a counterfactual claim about the real world, about how things were different. If you take this pill, you'll get better. Well, that's a very simplistic thing. Uh, in the randomized controlled trials, but in another way, you say if we introduce this policy, things will get better, or things will be different, like Brexit. Anyway, so uh, the top of the of the uh, uh, evidence hierarchy is randomized controlled trials, and we we frankly very rarely do it, but it's really striking. I've been watching the American uh, world, and there you you get, despite the fact that they've got complete ideological polarization in Congress, and you can't get anything sensible <coughs> through. There's all sorts of really interesting things happening outside that world where people are undertaking what amount to virtually randomized controlled trials or quasi-experimental designs on key policy areas in education, in health, and elsewhere. So it is, it is, it is possible, um, but, but the truth is in our kind of uh, uh, area, we kind of, you know, the British approach sort of muddling through a little bit, and it seems to work, and let's give it another try. Um, so I've been doing stuff on quasi-experimental methods, um, I won't go into it now because we don't have time, but uh, I think that's got a lot going for it because you actually don't have to have a randomized controlled trial. Um, but you can get second best to that and you can come up with much more plausible and causally defensible outcomes, which is basically what we're trying to achieve. Because what you don't want is some guy to stand up in the audience and say, oh, you didn't control for such and such. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. So, you know, you've got to somehow be able to uh, fend off most of those, those sort of critiques. Finally, observational designs and torture by statistical analysis, which is generally the way we go. We torture things with uh, fancy statistical techniques in order to get certain outcomes, and, and sometimes a little bit hard to defend. Anyway, the point I'm coming to now is simulation techniques. So, simulation techniques are out, allow you to ask the counterfactuals. Um, are, uh, they, they're not necessarily causal in the sense of a hard, hard randomized control trial, but if you look at the whole debate about climate change, there's no randomized control trial we can carry out. On, on the climate of the world. But what we can do is create a computer model of how we think, um, what the drivers are for certain trends that are going on in, in various climate uh, indicators. And then we can say, you know, if we tweak these indicators so we can't limit these emissions uh, at this level, um, it, we're going to have these outcomes, which is a progressive warming, and all the down, uh, downstream consequences. So that's how I got a, a, a into simulation, uh, got interested in computer techniques. In fact, Nigel Gilbert, who's the head of CCAM, uh, um, I went to summer schools that he ran in Germany, uh, all the way from New Zealand to learn about uh, 
uh, social simulation, it was called, which was, which was you know, a complete revelation. Because I was thinking to myself, we can't do big, big thought experiments with society. You know, as a sociologist, you, you, you're thinking big. But maybe we can do it on a computer model that looks like society. We can try various things. So this is what climate change. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples um, uh, just to show you. So this first one is an example of a randomized controlled trial. This is looking at the efficacy of infant simulator programs to prevent teenage pregnancy. And the idea is you give teenage girls, and maybe boys, I don't know, little, little kids that have to look after. And the idea is that they, they realize that they're a hell of a lot more trouble than they think they are. The amazing thing is it's never been properly evaluated. It was just on somebody's hunch. Like sending crims and ex-crims into schools and saying, God, don't go down the criminal track like I do, like I did, you know, and, and uh, you know, and so all the boys will get scared off. Far from it, they get intrigued. Oh, yeah, he looked tough. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you, you get, get results which are completely counter. So anyway, so, so it was a randomized controlled trial. They, it's been introduced to 80 to 90 countries, and they thought they'd try it. It's called the Virtual Infant Parenting Program. They thought they'd try it in, in Western Australia. They had a because they were thinking of introducing it, some smart cookie said, why don't we actually test this? Um, and the conclusion was infant simulated VIP program did not achieve its aim. More than that, uh, the, the, the intervention group had a higher birth rate and higher abortion rate. So, you know, it actually, not only did it have no result, it had the opposite result. So, you know, this, and this is the Lancet, this is a medical journal, just within the last month or two, this, this paper's been published. So we're talking about contemporary uh, decisions being made with very poor um, evaluative uh, um, approach to these things because it looks good, sounds good, I want to do something quick, you know, you know it's been done somewhere else, must be okay, etc. Okay, so, um, so that's, I can't do randomized controlled trials, so I'm looking at using, an example I'm going to give you is using computer-based scenarios. Look, okay, just uh, uh, in the last few weeks I came across this next paper, it's called the Journal of Conflict Resolution, I, I don't, I'm not defending the topic or anything, or the words used, or what these guys are looking at. What about if there hadn't been this conflict with, with the, in southeast Turkey with the, uh, <coughs> yeah, with the Kurds? Well, you, that's, how can you conduct a, you know, a, a, an experiment on that? You can't. So what they did was they, they, they looked at the, they created a synthetic control method. We created a synthetic control group that mimics the socioeconomic characteristics of the provinces exposed to terrorism before the PKK. Uh, we then compare the real gross to most product of the synthetic provinces without terrorism to the actual provinces, and then they argue that it results in 6.6% relative thing. So that's, that's the kind of thing that one is doing in this area. One's working in areas where you count, uh, uh, you, want, you want to be able to draw some conclusions. I'm not saying this is the definitive conclusion. This is one conclusion you might draw along with a number of other methods you might use, like back of the envelope, ideological preference, what the, M, the prime minister, your, your minister wants, etc., etc. Um, and this is one <coughs> of the Journal of Conflict Resolution, uh, 2015, uh, where they kind of, uh, and you know, I think, well, it's just a fancy idea, they just have these ideas. So, um, but i just give you an example, that's the counterfactual form of thinking. What if the world had been different? Uh, what conclusions could we have drawn about that? And then a lot of the discussion is about how how realistic that is or not. Okay, so that's the first part. I think I'm doing quite well. Uh, I thought 10 minutes on the first bit, 10 minutes on the second bit, and 20 minutes on the, on, the, on the case studies. Any questions before I go on? Okay, good one. So micro simulation, what is it? So, you know, I will only give you the um, cornflake packet version of, of what micro simulation is. Um, and the truth is, it's, uh, under, underdeveloped, underintellectualized, and what I've discovered is you get uh, people creating microsimulation models for a particular project, project funding ends, and microsimulation models sitting on somebody's hard drive, all the supporting papers are in the bottom drawer somewhere, and everyone forgets about it. No one could possibly replicate it, which is a real problem. And then the other, the other end of the spectrum, you have departments of state, like the pensions department in this country, which has the most sophisticated, elaborate, long, long-standing developed microsimulation models in order to predict pension needs, which is actually one of the original reasons why microsimulation was developed. Um, but that's hidden within the, the bowels of a, you know, uh, a, a, a bureaucratically protected silo, and no one gets to see it. And you can understand it to some extent. At least that's how I see it. I might be wrong. 
Um, and the best thing would be if they opened these things up more, because somebody might say, hang on, you, one assumption you made there is absolutely wrong. Or somebody else might say, you could cut out all these lines of code and just use this little, little uh, gizmo that I found on the internet that will cut right through it. You know, so uh, there is a problem. There's no, no package. For when we, when we, the first microsimulation model we wrote was an SAS. Lines of it, you know, just to get all the bloody, uh, you know, various decisions and all the rest of it. So now we use R. You know, all of a sudden, you know, in, in, in 10 years, R is completely transformed because you've got all these uh, free open source things which you can use. It doesn't do the microsimulation for you, but it cuts a lot of, uh, lots of corners. Okay, so it's a simulation approach. And what, it mean, what that means is it uses computational techniques to mimic reality. So um, we're trying to simulate the real world. In my experience, it's actually most useful in representing processes because it's, it's at its best on a trajectory, pension schemes, life course, uh, tax implications, employment trajectories, labor market things. This is what I've seen at the few conferences I've been to. I'm not a micro-simulation guru, but you know, I'm somebody who wants to find uh, techniques and devices that will help grapple with real-world issues, including policy questions. So I'm kind of drawing on my experience. So I think it's best for these, these kind of process type things. And as a sociologist, I like it because it actually has real people in it. Uh, Microsimulation is based on simulating individuals' movements. And as sociologists, I like to think there are real people in there based on real data. And it's moving. And I like the idea of the, uh, the movement. Typically, the model represents a transition between states. So a person, you know, look at demographic thing. A person might, you know, look at the life course. Kid gets born within a certain probability. The, the parents might or might not still be partnered within a certain probability. They might or might not go to preschool with a certain probability. They might or might not pass their, uh, their uh, exams at, at school, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you've got all these probabilities that go through a person's life. Uh, which are based on real, they're not you know, made up, they're based on real data. Uh, and that's one of our projects, which is the second one, which is a dynamic one, which is uh, life course. But there are other ones like pension accrual, this is a classic, this is why, this is why uh, you know, the entire American pension system <laughs> is based on this guy who, de who developed it back in 1957, uh, Orcutt, uh, and uh, he just suddenly had this idea that he could do it and, and it's been picked up in that way. Uh, it's very granular, so it means it represents transitions at the level of individuals, and that's why I like it. Um, and they're distributed across different contexts. So you've got solo parents, you've got, you've got, uh, uh, you've got partnered households, you've got male, you've got female, you've got ethnic variation, you've got socioeconomic variation, you've got regional variation. All these are sort of granular things you can break down your transitions into, and that's why it, it gets at the complexity of real life in a way that standard, sometimes standard economic models do not which have a standard supply and demand curve. Um, you know, and so this is kind of breaking that down to multiple subgroups in the population. And then once you've created the model, obviously you have to make sure it actually replicates the real world. Um, it can be projected forward. Um, like typically in the tax area, you might say, what happens if we increase the rate of VAT? Well, yeah, you want to know about that. So you, you sort of can put that into your model of the tax benefit system and click it and see, well, you know, will that make a difference to um, um, uh, inflation, um, employment, um, consumption, etc. Or you can uh, alter uh, various parameters. So what you do is you build a realistic computer-based model. So we, the second case that I'm going to do is early childhood. We used an existing cohort studies. In fact, we used multiple ones. So we, we melded the estimates from different um, um, birth cohorts in order to get our best estimates of, because these were done at different times uh, in New Zealand history. So you, got, you can get different estimates over time. Um, you, you build a computer, you then, you, you, then um, you, you derive the drivers of that model. So we actually use pretty fancy statistical techniques to kind of predict what's the probability of a, say, a, kid, uh, a kid's um, reading age at age nine. Well, the best prediction of that is their reading age at age eight, <laughs> in case you're wondering. But uh, you, you could have a fancy, you know, you, you can actually almost automate these regression equations where you get the best predictors. And that helps you predict for different groups um, the likely transition um, 
and you use that. So then, so what happened was I borrowed this bird cable off this guy, the real duck, then I handed it back because I now had my computer model. Didn't need it anymore. And I, of course, validated it, made sure it reproduced his study. And that, <coughs> that's one of the other things about it. You, you actually are not invading anybody's privacy. You've created a synthetic model that's not going to upset anybody uh, because it's derived from the real world and you've got a stochastic element in there. And even now, we, we're using the New Zealand Longitudinal Census, which is derived from the New Zealand Census. And we're allowed to do those things and we're allowed to make predictions, etc., because um, we actually do it in a protected environment, but all the results we take out. Um, so that's another advantage. You create a synthetic data set that replicates the real world by applying those drivers, and it does it in a stochastic way, so that you run it one time, and you might get this estimate for the uh, reading age, uh, uh, reading ability at age nine, and then you run it again, and you might get it this way, you get it from the distribution. So you use a stochastic element in order to get distributions, uh, so which means that you get something like the real world, real contingency of, 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 of the world without within the parameters of, of what your uh, source data is telling you. And then you can assess policy options on the synthetic data by altering key parameters. And so in the life course one, we were engaging with government departments and they were the sort of questions they were asking, um, you know, what about if we uh, increase the, uh, the, the amount of early childhood education to 100%? So then you alter the uptake of early childhood education up 100% and see what difference. It actually doesn't make a lot of difference um, because it's already pretty high anyway. So, uh, but that's the kind of thing you can do. You can start um, altering key parameters. And I'll give you examples. So here are some examples. Euromod, which is the one you may or may not be familiar with. It comes out of Essex, University of Essex, Institute of Social and Economic Research. It's a European one. I hope it, uh, it, it outlasts Brexit. Um, because it's, it's done in such a way that it can work across all uh, 27, 28 countries because they all uh, implement their different tax benefit systems into it, including the British one. Uh, and so it's a kind of a, a, a generic uh, microsimulation model with different settings for different countries. Um, and uh, that's, that's uh, another one, a, a, a recent one from OECD. Uh, questions about what, what happens if you change your policy on alcohol, say increase the cost, um, um, what, what about if you encourage people to go and see their doctor more? So again, it's a, a model, and they applied it in three countries, Canada, Germany, and Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic, sorry. Uh, so you had a generic model, and then you'd apply the characteristics of those countries um, to, to, the, to that model, uh, and then you'd run it through, and surprise, to my surprise, what they found was the brief interventions of primary care actually had more effect than, than uh, tax increases. So if your doctor tells you you're drinking too much, you're more likely to stop it than if the price goes up. But how many doctors tell their patients that? Anyway, so that, that was, that was a, a, so that's a OECD thing, just uh, produced in the last, um, 2015. So this is current, um, and uh, it, it, you know, is, uh, another one, oops, so this one's another one, Institute for Fiscal Studies, which is one of your own outfits here, which I've got great respect for. Um, what they were looking for was uh, a lifetime perspective. Now, of course, in the long run, we're all dead. So how the hell do you get a lifetime perspective on any uh, policy? So what they had to do is create a synthetic cohort out of real data. Um, so that based on simulated data, because there's no UK surveys or administrative data set can, can provide information about the full life cycle. Bang. You know, there is a real reason why you need uh, something uh, uh, because the data just isn't there. So they designed to replicate experience of the baby boom cohort. They use a British household panel survey, living costs and food survey, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They constructed synthetic cross sections, describe what the patient looked like. And I'll give you a few examples. So the reason why it's so useful. Okay, so here you've got the green, which is a cross section. So if you were, if you were looking at unemployment in New Zealand, uh, sorry, in the UK, uh, you'd see those green figures and you'd see that the poorest people had only 20% employed. And the richest people had 95% uh, employed. Yeah, well, great. Uh, that's, that's intuitive. But then if you look at the lifetime, you find that the levels of unemployment, of employment, are remarkably uh, narrowed. So that over a lifetime, people who are currently in the poorest decile will have about a 60 to 65% likelihood of being employed. 
and the rich have got a likelihood of being an 80%. That's not a huge difference. So, you know, this is something that you might have surmised, but only with this kind of data where you kind of recreate uh, in a kind of rigorous fashion uh, a life cycle, which, you know, otherwise would be impossible to do. You can, how this would affect the policy debate, I've got no idea, but, but it's just a useful addition. I'll give you another example. Um, means tested benefits. So, as you might expect, uh, the poorest deciles, one, two, and three, uh, 80 to 90 percent of them are on mean tested benefits. Yeah, what do you expect? All those poor people that are bludging off the taxpayer. But then, when you, and then down to the richest, 0.24, that's Trump probably, 0.25 percent uh, are getting a means tested benefit. Um, but then, if you look at lifetime, you can see that it's actually quite well distributed across all the deciles, the current deciles. So the current poorest, um, sure, they do have more likelihood, but the richest at one time may not have been in that category. And they've got a, 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 a mean-tested benefit likelihood over their lifetime of about 20%. So this is the kind of, this is the kind of uh, informed speculation, which is actually better informed than normal informed speculation, um, which is based on uh, what one hopes is a valid replicable um, computer model. It's kind of helpful to do things which <coughs> in normal circumstances you could never do and which actually assists the policy making process because you've got one other uh, iron in the fire, one other string to your bow, one other arrow in your quiver to sort of uh, you know, line things up uh, to see whether what, what speculation might look like. Okay, any, that's an indigenous parakeet in New Zealand. Uh, any initial questions? Yeah. So this just came to mind when you showed the IFS one. Before. Yeah. So as we, and we're about halfway complexity. Yeah, yeah. So as we try and build more complex models, mm. and we reach points where we can build, but we don't necessarily know what will come out. So the early models, yeah. we know broadly what they will show, but perhaps mm. they give us yeah. a range of scenarios. Mm. Should, do you think it's important that we should always be able to go back and explain why we're seeing a result? Mm. Should we expect to reach a point as we develop more complex models where we can't say why in which yeah, it's yeah. positive? No, look, look, I think the complexity aspect, look, I'm a complexity agnostic, I have to say. Um, I think intellectually it's thoroughly intriguing and I try to follow that path. But I've yet to find a practical application that uh, was worth all the effort in the social sciences. But I do feel this is, this, uh, this micro simulation stuff is really too much nose to the grindstone, frankly. You know, it's thoroughly boring. We're kind of, you know, doing these things, although it does allow thought experiments, which add a little bit of complexity. But I, I completely agree with you. And, and uh, in agent-based modeling, you're much more likely to be able to get uh, unexpected results out of interactions occurring at a, at a base level with uh, implications at another level or another time, which you couldn't possibly predict. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think a, there is a shortcoming. I, I don't think we can even though this is set up on the CCAT, which has got a complex, complexity uh, brief. Um, I, 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 I thought about it, and I'd like to pursue it further. Um, for example, different levels. You know, in sociology, you can't assume that the individual actions will automatically be, be uh, transferred into aggregate things. There has to be a whole lot of intervening things going on there, which help you understand how it plays out. So that's complex, whether it's complexity science is another thing. No, good question. I don't agree. It's a little bit, little bit nose to grindstone and stuff I'm giving you. Okay. Right, thanks. <laughs> yeah. How, how, I, I suppose the, the object of the exercise is to um, extract some sort of a policy out of all this simulation. Uh, it, it, if this is the case, then how do you do it? Yeah, so no, the object of the exercise is to pursue uh, a policy scenario or a uh, policy idea, which could well be quite a fanciful one, which you couldn't do in the real world. You say, hello, Peter, you've got this com fancy computer model. Tell me what would happen if we, like, say we reintroduce all these grammar schools. <laughs> Can you tell me, uh, given this fancy educational model you've got about how people, you know, you know, 11 plus and all that, you might have a whole lot of stuff that goes back to 11 plus and what that happened, how it set people off on various trajectories. And you could say, we've got the teacher union saying this, we've got the prime minister saying that, <coughs> what are you saying? So that's all it does. It doesn't actually say this is the correct policy. It says, given the shortcomings of dealing with the real world, I've got this model here, and if we put in an 11 plus there, 
this is the kind of thing happened, and lo and behold, I think it would just funnel off all the working class kids in that direction, and the middle class kids in that direction, the social mobility would no longer be any, any more enhanced than you think it would. So, you know, but look, that's right, it doesn't actually make the policy for you, it helps you clarify the decision points and helps you envision, envision what the world might look like if you pursued a particular policy. That's, that's, and I'll show you a couple of examples. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, good hope. So um, I'll say a little bit, this is uh, the chunk, the main part of it, the, but the, the, a, bit, a bit about the team and portfolio, but mainly about the two models. So um, we've been going about 15 years, we're grant funded, which I can tell you is no fun. Uh, um, and we've got about, about five of us. That, that group there, we're greatly diminished from what you can see there. And we're standing in front of the form in the south of Fale, which is a Pacific Island meeting house. Um, but we're greatly diminished from that. It's been tough, and the baby's grown up. It's now at school, so uh, and we and we rely a lot on graduate students, which is great. We've got a close association with the stats department. We frankly can't find any social scientists with relevant quantitative skills, uh, so we use stats students. We're big users. Mostly we use existing data because collecting data is so expensive. You can chew up your whole grant just collecting the stuff. And secondly, there is a lot of data out there that can add value to, it, and that's where we see our niche. And that's why the simulation comes in. We use existing data, add value to it, um, you know, to make it sort of, uh, and, and uh, our area is the modeling one. And generally, you need, no one person can do this. You need to draw on bits and pieces of a number of people. So uh, it usually have a couple of colleagues, research fellow, statistician, data manager. A little bit of their time will be on any given project. This is our simulation portfolio. I'm not going to ask you to look through it, but we started in 2005 with an native based model. And we've gone, we've done a number of projects in health and social policy. I mean, to some extent, we followed the money, uh, I have to say. Um, and uh, we, you know, we, we've gained funding from the, the, the two funders earlier on, MB, which is the Applied Research Funder, and the Health Research Council. And what I'm going to talk to you today is the static model, which is um, aging, uh, in fact, uh, aging on health policy, and a dynamic model, which is kind of more of a life course one, and those are the two I'm picking out. Um, and these, and I can tell you what, one problem here is how do you document these things, how you retain the intellectual, we're not, we're not interested in protecting our intellectual property, we'd love it if people use the stuff. Uh, the problem is, 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 is capturing it in a way that somebody else could actually understand it and quite possibly run it. What happens if your key modeler leaves? You know, you're stuck, unless you've got the thing well documented, all the code with proper uh, descriptions in it, etc., etc. Otherwise, you, you take, you, you know, we take at least six months to bring a person up to speed, uh, getting on for a year. Right. So this is the, this is the static model, primary care and aging society, Picasso. Um, that, that's 2005, 2008. We just published the last paper from that. So that's eight years later. You know, that's what it takes. Uh, Health Research Council, and what I was, what I was interested in was um, we, were, we were interested in looking at if, if we're trying to predict the age, what impact the aging society is going to have, we need to look at three parties. This is how we thought about it. We need to look at the people, the older people. They're getting older, they're living longer, uh, they're living a heck of a lot longer. Are they suffering disability and illness? We need to factor that. We need to look at the family and household because those people are not on their own. Their families might look after them, or they may fail to. For example, daughters might be entering the workforce, who the heck's going to look after them? Because pre previously that was the role of the daughter. Um, you know, so does it make any difference to that? And then finally, the doctors. How will the doctors respond? Will they treat older people? Um, like, people, sometimes people say 60 is the old 40. Well, uh, have the doctors moved on in their, <laughs> in their consciousness, or are they still treating 60-year-olds as if they really were 60-year-olds, and plugging them full of drugs, etc., etc.? You know, so you, you know, the, the doctor's threshold of intervention is an important thing. So you won't find a data set with those three things in it. So we, we, we kind of put this thing together, and I'll just show you how we did it. So, so first of all, we had New Zealand National Survey, which is the Ministry of Health ran, and there is it on, it's called the National Health Survey, run on a regular basis. Um, in the one we had, which is 2002, we only had adults, so we then had to bring the children in from an earlier one. You know, this is the kind of thing you have to do to sort of make these things, uh, never, all the data's not in the right spot. Secondly, we had doctors. So we had, a, we had a survey of doctors, which is actually quite unusual in New Zealand, uh, or anyway for that matter. Um, so what we did was we gave these people doctors, because 
uh, they weren't in the survey. And then we worked out from our survey of 240 doctors the kind of patients they had. And then we matched them up with the people in the... So this, we're already moving from your hard reality to something a little bit more uh, difficult to defend. But, you know, as long as you can show that the results look like the real world, you, you work. So we had doctors meshed back in to people in our survey that looked like the patients those doctors had in the real world. Um, then we, what we didn't have was uh, the illnesses. You know, in the New Zealand Health Survey, they didn't ask people, Do you have, did you have some symptoms in the last couple of weeks? They don't ask that. So then we used the Australian Health Survey, which does ask that. And uh, two countries are culturally very similar, um, and the results are very, you know, people in the two-week period, of 90% of people will, represent, will say they had some symptoms, most of them pretty minor, and, you know, you can tell from the literature whether or not the results and then finally, we went back to our doctor survey and said, if, if they have a patient coming through the door with a particular set of symptoms, what do they do? And then, so we had the full uh, trajectory of people in the community suffering various illnesses and disabilities with their kids, with their doctor, uh, in a given two-week period. So we chopped up the year into 25 two-week periods in order to get through the year. Uh, what symptoms they like to experience. In the Australian thing, they then asked, when you had those symptoms, did you go to the doctor? because that's what we needed, what likelihood, and of course men are less likely to go to doctors, to the doctor than women, um, there's a whole lot of things and you know, you've got various uh, established patterns there, and then when they got to the doctor, what does the doctor do? If you come along with uh, uh, typical uh, flu, if the doctor's got any sense, they say take liquids, don't take antibiotics, and all the rest of it, and on the hand, if they feel under pressure, they might say here's the pills, it might make you feel better, so yeah, you've got to factor in all those sort of likelihoods. So uh, we, we then created a, a, a health history for our whole sample. So we have a typical uh, male, ID2, this is number two in our sample of 15,000 people. Age 40, partnered, they had a respiratory illness uh, in the last two weeks, they went to the doctor. Uh, the doctor, this is all done on a probabilistic basis on real data, so it's not, it's not deterministic. They went to the doctor and on this patient, at this time, in this two week period, the doctor ordered an investigation, which is a very sensible thing to do. They did not write a prescription, which I'm very glad to see, uh, and they suggested they come back and follow up. So, uh, so then we did that for all our all the, the people in the sample in any given two week period. So we were able to build up uh, a, a typical year uh, of of a, a sample of 15,000 people. So uh, and what the doctors did. So, and I wrote up this paper in Health Policy, published in 2010, using microsimulation to create a synthesized data set and test policy <coughs> policy options. So we were asking, you know, what, what is the likelihood? And uh, just to give you an idea of how this scenario thing goes, so what we did was we um, set up a scenario map. So what we have here along the left-hand side, autonomous aging, which is what we'd like to happen, is people would live, continue to live in the community, supported by their family, pretty healthy state. Service dependent aging means <coughs> they would be, require a lot more medical intervention, etc. Then along the top you've got the practitioners. Are they, uh, are they likely to, to follow a more of an intensified medical model where they intervene, that's intensification, or they sort of treat people uh, as more of a, a social aging process and uh, you know don't intervene too often. And then illness experience, um, when people get older, there's two theories, because people are, we're, we're, we're increasing our life expectancy at 1% a year, we've been doing that for the last half century, so, it, you know, sometimes it's got to stop, <laughs> but it's still going, and, uh, but the thing is, what happens to the extra years, you know, if you've got uh, X extra years, are you ill, or are you healthy, so one, one scenario is compression, is it, it all happens in the last six months, that you know you go fine, you know, then it all happens in the last year, let's say. And the other one's expansion is that as you get older, more of your years are, are spent in some form of ill health. And those have quite different implications. And so we had two scenarios. The best scenario would be compression of morbidity, meaning basically, you know, you lived old, you were older, but you were also fitter, because the next generation is, is healthier, the previous generations, they're not smoking for a start. Uh, and they haven't yet put on the weight like all the other ones have. And, uh, and you know, and then you've got the GP. It's more enlightened. He doesn't kind of fill full and full pills. He says, "Oh well, why don't you go and join a club or take more exercise, or whatever?" And they have autonomous aging because they've got a family that supports them. So that would be the best scenario. Three pluses. 
The worst scenario would be three minuses, which would be service-dependent aging, expanded morbidity, and doctors who intervene a lot. So we, were, we, we sort of worked out these scenarios with a before and after thing. And our, and our, so for example, the mean number of visits. So if you have compression of morbidity, autonomous aging, you, you, you get basically between the two, you get a doubling of visits depending on what happens. If, if there's an expansion of morbidity, then you're going to get a doubling of, of visits to the doctor. If, if it's compression of morbidity, you've got a halving you know, over, over a year. This is over a year, 8.8 .8 visits a year for 60 people of 65 months. So that, that's pretty major. Um, you know, for, for a policy maker thinking, we don't know whether it's going compression or, or expanded, but, but depending on which way it goes, or it could go somewhere in a mixed version, uh, it's going to have different implications for the number of visits uh, people over 65 are going to be making uh, to the doctor. Uh, another one here is percentage of visits prescribed. Actually, the key thing is the number of people referred on to specialist treatment. I'm not sure I don't have that any of that. Uh, so, proportion prescribed. So, um, the best outcome is about uh, half the visits. Uh, the older people are making sort of, um, you know, eight, eight visits a year, about half of which um, they're going to be prescribed on. And that's the best outcome. And you can see that if you compare autonomous aging and service dependent, it actually doesn't vary much. And if you look at compression and expanded, you know, the, the number of visits uh, doubles. But if you go down to uh, doctors being much more interventionist, uh, you get 90% prescribing rates on 14 uh, visits, and that's the worst outcome. Now, I'm not saying which of those will happen. The drug companies will tell you that that's the one that's going to happen. You know, uh, so you do have financial interests, and I, I don't discount the drug company. You know, I mean, obviously they've got a, a commercial agenda, but 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 they may be onto something. Uh, but at the same time, you're trying to dissuade doctors from prescribing too much, um, etc. So, so that's that's uh, the demographic aging model. Um, any questions about that? That yeah. If you're using data sets from different, which collected in different years, yeah. How, how do you adjust that? Yeah. Well, look. You, you, could, you could do, um, uh, in a way we were, this is the first micro simulation we, we put together, um, we tested against external, the best thing to do is to test against external benchmarks, for example you might have census data that could tell you uh, what the population looked like in a particular year, and so you can adjust on, age and gender would be the classic ones, you could adjust on to make sure that and that's one thing we've done. We've used census distributions for the population to say, okay, what about if we want to make our microsimulation model look like New Zealand in the in the uh, census year 2006? Uh, this is this is how we adjust it. Yeah, that's what we do. And all you can do is the age and gender. You can't say, okay, are the illness levels different? You know, do they less less likely to go to the doctor with symptoms? You're not able to do that. But that's uh, that's one way to do it. Okay, so let's go on to the, the dynamic model. Um, so I'll, I'll, this is a seminar I gave a couple of years ago at London School of Hygiene, and this is what I'd really like to, to be able to see to fruition, that I, I think I might be, uh, this might be an impossible dream. Uh, assessing policy counterfactual with a simulation-based inquiry system. What I'd love to have is an inquiry system, you know, where you had all the moving parts and you could say, yeah, let's ask it a question, uh, like a knowledge system. Uh, and, and what we've since done with this data set is actually start to use uh, estimates from the literature uh, to embed in the model to improve, you know, get it closer to the literature. So you, look, you do a meta-analysis of, for example, a classic would be the long-term implications of um, early childhood education. You know, there's, some, there's some actually some randomized controlled trials in that area, and you could say, well, okay, let's use the estimates from that rather than some funny old New Zealand survey of a thousand kids, you know. Uh, you might use that estimate and plunk it in there. So you, you kind of move from the traditional uh, meta-analysis literature review to an embedded inquiry system into which you could insert uh, these estimates of, of the moving parts. Um, and, uh, and in answer to my earlier you know, colleague here, in a way it's a bit kind of linear and driven in a particular direction, but I've often wondered whether at one point you could complexify it and, and give it some more um, uh, spontaneity. Uh, so we started with a sample of individuals, we derived statistical rules, we created a virtual cohort, essentially, gave the money, gave the, 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 the data back to our colleagues, and then we looked at the simulations. We had an end users group, 
Ministry of Social Development, Ministry of Health. Frankly, they saved the project. I mean, I just think the project would have just sort of been a little bit ho-hum. And these guys, uh, women and men, came along and put us through our paces and, and suggested scenarios, etc., which you know were, were things that they were thinking about. And, um, and in fact, we, we published a paper in Evidence and Policy with all of them as co-authors. Um, here's an example of the, 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 uh, pap the published publication of where we used it to sort of uh, argue a toss about, about some feature of public health, sort of health person, Roy, uh, Social Science and Medicine. Um, and um, he gave <coughs> a seminar on this, and we, we wanted to know about how important are structural factors, because a lot of the, the traditional approaches towards individual behavior change, and we thought, what about, you know, uh, could you change structural features of society, like um, improving people's uh, access to education or income or whatever. So uh, we, we, we looked at the social determinants model and we asked ourselves, could structural factors be more important or less important than behavioral ones? This is kind of a little bit of an obscure debate. <laughs> but um, there is a whole area called the social determinants of, of health framework. And they operate where they look at big picture results like socioeconomic position, education, occupation. Then they look at mediating results, behavior, etc. And some people argue you ought to intervene there. And some people argue, you, ought to, you know, these are the more kind of radical types. You need public policy, social policy, macroeconomic policy. Um, that's what you should be doing. But my, my view is you should be doing both. It should be, uh, you know, one needs to reinforce the other, frankly, and then the intervening one. So, so um, that, that, that's what we're doing. I'm not sure you guys would be interested in that. But I'm just showing this because it's a published paper. Um, and then we thought, well, what effect is improving various factors? Single or multiple factors, structural media, and then we looked at reading ability, conduct problems as well. So it wasn't just GP visits; we were looking at health system use, educational outcomes, and 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 the sort of justice uh, corrections, sort of conduct problems type thing. And that was our model. Uh, it's using the Christchurch data. We'll go into it. It sort of pretty looked like the model I showed you. We improve single factors. We improve multiple factors. We compare the relative effects. We pose best case scenarios. And what was the result? Changing a single factor has slight effect. Um, structural factors seem to have a slightly greater effect, seem to have a greater effect for the most disadvantaged people. So sometimes it's a bit like passive. If you require active changes, the middle class are more likely to take them up. Uh, if you uh, make broader structural, contextual changes where people don't have to make a conscious decision and look at their environment and think, oh, I've got to improve my lot and do X, Y, or Z, then you, you you know, you, you raise all the boats to some extent. That's the idea. And we found similar findings for the, for the other outcomes. So that's the life course model. Uh, any questions about that? That was just uh, uh, using uh, existing cohort studies and using the, the, the probabilities estimated from within that uh, model to look at how people transition through life. Uh, as it was, we only looked at the early life course. Um, and earlier on, a colleague was asking about complexity. One of the issues about about uh, uh, micro simulation is that the more you build on, the more unstable the model's going to become because you're getting stochastic probabilities building on earlier stochastic probabilities, unless you have some form of um, steadying effect along the way, you can get outcomes that actually don't make a lot of sense. So we restricted this to the early life course. And it could be you split it up. You have early life course, and middle life course, and later life course in order to overcome those kind of tendencies for the body to get destabilized because you just got too much stochasticity going on. Yeah? So with the life course model, the, the transitions between stages, yeah. um, how, how much choice goes into that? Meaning? Uh, as opposed to just being driven by just the stats saying, well, this yeah, is, no, that's this it. Five stages, this that's stuff. right. So <coughs> it, it is entirely stats driven. And where the choice comes in, on, you know, so it looks very predetermined, but where it could come in, you could say, well, for example, in New Zealand, we introduced uh, great requirements of work testing for sole parents. Okay, so that, that sort of gets at your answer in a roundabout way. So we would say, well, what about if uh, sole parents had to go to work more, um, and we introduced those as, as if they'd voluntarily done it, but actually they were forced to do it because of the 
change in policy, requiring more work testing, what would be the effects on the kids? Would their kids run a mark, et cetera, et cetera, you know? So that's the way you've introduced choice. Um, but you could introduce it and have a greater degree of randomness uh, about how people make their decisions, um, you know, in, in, uh, <coughs> extend the distribution. So, for example, we had to run models for uh, sole parents versus partnered because they were kind of so different in many ways. And then they would switch when, if a sole parent got partnered, then they'd, they'd switch back to that model. And so I'm afraid it's a little bit, it looks a little bit kind of clunky and linear. Um, but I think if it was, if I knew more than I do, and if I had more advice from people like you, you probably you could insert a choice element into it. Yeah. I was just wondering, so is there a danger of double count? So if you take the effect size of, say, mm. improving a structural determinant yeah. outcome, You've got to control and then, the behavior. And then you also put the behavior of the yeah. wall elsewhere. Is there yeah. a danger of double counting? Yeah, there is a danger of that. Yeah. So you what you yeah, so that for example, classic one would be obesity, let's say. So a lot of people argue, argue it's the obesogenic environment. Others argue it's individual change. And you can go to the literature and then you wonder whether the individual change thing is allowed for the fact that uh, some people live in are living in parts of town where they're constantly being exposed to sort of access to um, uh, McDonald's, etc. Uh, so yeah, now that, that is an issue. And and but you know, and thank you very much for raising it. This is one of the great things about what, what we did when we enhanced this model to put in the um, uh, the estimates from the literature. I thought, my God, we'll be bloody overwhelmed. Hey guys, stick to the stick to the systematic analyses. Well, we were still overwhelmed because there's in the in the child area there's a ton of systematic analyses and meta analyses and so on. So then you can go hunting around and say which one's done the right thing by controlling for uh, the influence of these extent. But you're absolutely right, yeah. So it's to do with almost the quality of the studies you've got. Yeah, yeah. Even if they control That's right. Uh, this whole thing is absolutely subject to the quality of the data, yeah. Right. And, and on the model, um, uh, yeah. And, but but, but the, you do test it against external benchmarks. So it's not as if you're just flying blind. So you've got to say, well, okay, Peter, all very nice, but can you reproduce... Um, you know, does this actually look like New Zealand in the year, uh, year 2006, <coughs> where uh, there is this proportion of sole parents and this proportion of that and this proportion of different ethnic groups? That's uh, a real, you know, that really brings you back. You yeah. know, puts you on your back. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. How, how would you <coughs> take into account the uh, inherently unpredictable nature of human activities? Yeah. 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 So. So what, what we do is we're drawing on real data. So now, so inherent unpredictability, in a way what you're saying is the, 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 the statistical distribution of a particular behavior is wider. That's what you're saying. Is what? Is the, the distribution yeah. is wider, what you're saying. I mean, if it's tight, then it's more predictable. So we just go on the distributions in the data. And so the unpredictable ones are the ones where either we've got a very weak statistical uh, uh, um, regression equation and or the distribution of the parameter is much broader. So that's, so th that's where you introduce, I mean you could talk about inherent but the degree of predictability varies. You know, so like a life course is one which is actually quite, so you know there's a thing called the child development model. You, know, you assume that kids uh, go through certain stages and in New Zealand if a Plunkett nurse sees your baby is in the wrong decile or the wrong percentile you'll get her word for it you know and you've got to, but um, without that's the joke really, but uh, <laughs> they do do that right? but um, yeah so you'd, you'd look at the distribution of the behaviour and the, the quotes inherently un unpredictable ones would be the ones with a broader distribution I mean I think frankly I think we've been saved by probabilistic models because, because that allows us to take into account your concept of predictability or lack of predictability. So, um, uh, you know, I'm not a statistician, but I've, I've grown up <laughs> as a semi-statistician. I mean, uh, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, uh, maybe what the gentleman was trying to say is also that in the example you gave earlier about teenage pregnancy. Yeah. So the probability of uh, the intervention being successful in any way is unknown at the time uh, before the intervention is yeah. actually implemented. Mm. So then I think at that point, it doesn't become the, the question of how wide the distribution is, mm. because you just don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I guess that's where you'd have a more Bayesian approach, where you'd say, well, um, what's our prior expectations? 
you know, and that's only one test. But the truth is, you know, I've come across this again and again, and I've put it through words for own. How can you justify introducing a policy for which there's been no evaluation of the likely outcome? You know, and it's true, on the basis of 100 interventions on a 5% basis, and you might get 5% showing the outcome, you know, I, I agree. So, um, um, but the truth is, you know, I find very often the best is the enemy of the good. You know, you've just got to, well, we're talking about incremental uh, knowledge, uh, and, and as long as we've got a, a community of discussion where we maintain, it, it's one of the problems, getting through those front door with all that damn uh, uh, security stuff, you sort of think, how the hell do we get talking to each other? And maintain a discourse that can, you know, keep going. So this kind of debates can continue. I totally agree with you. Yeah, yeah. Um, but at the same time, this is the thing about evidence-based medicine. I thought, wow, I was just so knocked back when I thought, yeah, these guys are claiming things are, are evidence-based, and they're not. We've just got to have it out there. And uh, on the balance of probabilities over time, when you do a, a number of replications, you might finally be confirmed one way or another. Yeah. OK. Conclusion. Um, oh, oh, by the way, I looked at this guy who did a microsimulation models and policy analysis, and he said there were 10 success factors, availability of the data, that's been a key thing. We've had it locked away in our country for far too long. It's only just started to come out. We just couldn't get hold of public data. Um, good IT practice, like sharing code, having <coughs> uh, uh, platforms and so on. Uh, modular design, so you can take things in and out. Uh, competitive market, so there's more than one person going at it. Um, early results, that's a key. You know, I, sometimes I talk to my guys in my group and say, hey, Gaggy, you've been going at this for three months. Can you tell me what the hell's going on? And it's all going on under the ground, so they need to sort of pop up with it. Um, and the, the truth is that microsimulation is, is good with a complex system. So that, that guy, is, the Dutch guy, was developing a pension scheme in the Dutch environment. So, conclusion. Uh, Microsimulation allows integration of individual data from various sources. That's frankly the thing I found most useful. It can model social mechanisms. You can create a virtual world uh, in which you can carry out whatever experiments. And I, I think it's a useful tool to augment knowledge facts. I don't think it's the end, be all end all and should be seen as one uh, of a number of tools. And here's a Dilma. Uh, I didn't have any accurate numbers, I just made them up. Studies have shown that accurate numbers are no more useful. <laughs> How many studies? 87! <laughs> <laughs> so, if there's any more questions, you will find them. Yeah? That's one of the, uh, <coughs> How you uh, assess the usefulness of this work yeah. compared with, say, uh, you know, well, work through the back of the envelope? Yeah. You know, how, how, how much extra you know, accuracy mm. or policy relevance do you, do you get? No, no it's hard to say. Because because testing that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, look, all I know is that in New Zealand now, the Treasury and all sorts of other people are building the microsimulation models because they realised, and they're trying to ensure interoperability because they realise that decisions they were making, and these are kind of pretty world shattering ones or you know, altering tax rates and the like, couldn't go on the back of the report. But um, the truth is, I, I'm a believer in just producing stuff which you never know when it's going to become relevant. And you try to do it in a strategic way so that at some point somebody will say, hey, by the way, Peter, what happened to that model you told me about the other day? We've just come across something where we'd like a little bit of counter evidence. But uh, I don't think you'll build a model exactly for a particular decision, but for a stream of, uh, of supportive uh, machinery that allows you to uh, check your decision sort of uh, considerations. Yeah, that's about all. Yeah. Working at CJ, we found that there's an enormous amount of work that goes into ex ante um, yeah. for the policy, so, you know, mm. and that's often like cost benefit and yeah. stuff like that, mm. and not much ex post, so yeah. after the event. Yeah. How would this kind of join up with the ex post side of things? Do you see what happened? Yeah, what yeah. Uh, look, I think the only way to do it is, um, <coughs> is to have a community of discourse, in my view. You know, we in our capital city is a <coughs> different town from Auckland. We just don't know the people down there. We just don't meet them walking down the street. You know, so it seems there's nothing to, to substitute for uh, informal and other exchanges so that people can say, yeah, OK, we're, we're looking at this particular thing. And, then, um, uh, and also, I, I would just see this as, as, a, as one strand. I wouldn't say that it's going to give you the final result, which you can't say in policy. Yep. I uh, suppose I've had five policies, and I ran your simulation mm. trillion Scenario. Yeah. And I got, I, I got a couple, I, got, I was able to rank them on their average performance yeah. in terms of the 
with the aim I had in mind. How do you have a robust and transparent and principled way of distinguishing between a policy which um, is great, is the best on average, mm. but has a lot of uncertainty of it, versus one that has narrow uncertainty but is not necessarily the best on average? Um, no, not necessarily. No, I can't. I can't think of how that would. Um, no, I'm not quite sure how you do that. Uh, I mean, what we can do is we can alter parameters so that we can, as this person suggests, you can, you could in, uh, uh, inject more uncertainty into into certain models. Um, so that um, uh, I, look, one way which I've come across colleagues doing in the health sector. Looking at alcohol policies, there's a whole range of possibilities. There's about five of them. <laughs> um, and so they've developed a, a cost-benefit type thing. And they're saying, well, this would be, this would be the likely cost of it. This would be the likely outcome of it, doing it on a sort of cost-benefit approach. That's one way they've done it. That doesn't actually get at the uncertainty thing, but it gets at the, the costs, uh, relative costs. And that's, I think, a great invention in cost-benefit analysis. It's been a huge invention that has moved us along to sort of consider the real impact of different decisions, uh, other than gut feeling. Um, yeah, sorry, I, on, on, on the hoof, I couldn't think of an adequate answer to that one. <laughs> yeah? Hi, um, my background's in system dynamics and discrete events. Yeah. So that's where my question yeah. is coming from. Um, in both those methods, part of the process uh, is about maps, yeah. the structure of the system with the stakeholders to use to yeah, so yeah, communicate yeah. the system with mm. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm not familiar with micro simulation, no. but was there any sort of mapping involved in, in that approach? Um, well, what, what this this one is very uh, driven by by the individual actors in it, and um, you could uh, it would be more complex. I don't know quite know how we do it. It's so data driven, while the system dynamics one is sort of as you say mapping at a more aggregate level. I think they're different tools for different purposes. I've seen agent-based <coughs> modeling where they've included stakeholders in it. Um, you know, like in the environmental area, you bring farmers in, you bring uh, environmental groups, etc., etc. And but there's a lot more speculation, and then and also in thought maybe they collect uh, um, qualitative information about how farmers would respond to particular interventions. I, I can see the two areas coming together more in future. Yeah, as as we have you know more of these discussions. Now. Yeah. So one of the things I've always considered about this kind of, particularly when you're making projections yeah. and you're making some sort of forward assessment, yeah. um, is how they're received by your customers, yeah. if you like. Yeah. So the extent to which your uh, your work with the various departments and yeah. industries you've been involved in, how has it been received? Has it been seen as a black box? It, it has, has a bit, yeah. Them? Yeah, I mean, they actually not quite know what to do with it. And we even supplied them with a laptop, and we don't know where they are now. <laughs> so, but the truth is, I've, what's intrigued me is the way in which I, I, I kind of think we were leading the way, and we seeded the idea of microsimulation. And now the data is much more available. The Treasury started to rebuild their microsimulation model. That's going to be inside the department. They're going to improve it in all sorts of ways. So I think what I feel I've done, and I could feel a little bit of kind of things all worthwhile, is that. Uh, pushing the agenda along and people within government departments are now building, they won't take ownership of our stuff, but they'll take ownership of the idea, they might bring us in as consultants, and that's a way in which we can we can engage with them. Okay. Yeah. I'm afraid we're about to be chucked out, I think, so we've run yeah. out of time. So if you could just join me in thanking um, Peter for his um, And if anyone does want to continue these discussions, some of us will be going to the clients just around the corner, so do, do come and join us uh, for a, a drink or a tea or coffee. Um, just so you're aware, our next seminar will be on the 11th of November, uh, and that will all be about complexity, power and evidence in the UK healthcare se uh, sector, and that will be Professor Trisha Greenhall from the University of Oxford. So do join us <coughs> if you want to find out more about CCAN, um, log on to our website, ccan.ac.uk, and sign up to our newsletter. Thank you so much for coming today and look forward to seeing you again soon.